That's right. It's time for your Sports Bros podcast. Thanks for joining us. My name is Andy Karchner, a.k.a. Big Bro, and I'm coming at you from Phoenix, Arizona. Hey, guys. I'm Little Bro. I'm Aaron Karchner. I am in San Antonio, Texas. Uh, tonight we're talking, you know, the offseason in BYU can sometimes be a little – a little dull, but today there was a lot, uh, some big news on a couple fronts. Um, BYU basketball, there's some news. Um, not so good news, some good news, depending on how you twist it. And then some really interesting news for BYU baseball, something we don't talk about much, even though we have a family member with that in their in their roots. But anyways, the Sports Bros Podcast, again, we're on iTunes, Stitcher, download us, um, listen to us tomorrow, listen to us uh, next week. That's cool. Uh, we got all of our old ones on there. Uh, tornbysports.com is where you're going to find all of our other podcasts and uh, reading material as well. So let's get it going. Uh, that's right. Make sure you tweet us at Sports Bros and uh, get in on the on the conversation. We got a lot to talk about tonight, um, Aaron. So we wanted to, I don't know, have this conversation now. You know, the NBA playoffs are in full swing. Um, college basketball is over, and the great Tyler Haas is now you know, done as a, as a Cougar. And the, the big question for BYU sports fans is will Tyler Hawes be drafted? Uh, what do you think, Aaron? Will he be drafted? If so, when? I, I don't, I don't think he will. I think um, what it comes down to is um, first of all, look, Jimmer, Jimmer had, in my opinion, a far superior offensive game to Tyler Hawes, strictly from a range standpoint, but also Jimmer could create his own shot a little better than, than Tyler Hawes. Um, I love Tyler Hawes. Everybody should know that by now. Um, he's got the best mid-range game I've ever seen, um, and he can knock down the free throws. I, I just don't think he has enough game. I think his game is Europe. I think it's 100% Europe, and I think he can be very successful in Europe. Um, he can shoot in Europe. He He's got size, you know, he's six, five, six, six in that range. Um, I just don't, I just don't see an NBA fit. If I have a hard time believing that if Jimmer for a kid that can, that can shoot from half court um, blindfolded, can't make a name in the league that Tyler Ha is a guy who can barely make his own shot. Amazing off the ball shooter or player in general, but the NBA is a one-on-one -on -one league and you have to be able to create your own shot down low up top um, guys that are off the screen kind of players like Tyler Hawes, you, you got to have a little bit more than that. And unfortunately, I just don't think Hawes has that. It, it, it pains me to say if he does get drafted, I think it'll be late on guaranteed contract and you'll have to make the team. You know, I got in a lot of trouble uh, during the Utah game um, when I – tweeted a negative tweet about Tyler Hawes because I was so frustrated at the time. He had screwed up a couple plays in a row and then, I don't know, like, I don't remember if he got a, if he kind of got rejected by the rim on a dunk or something like that and then got the ball stolen by DeLon Wright. And I just felt like his lack of athleticism was on display that game. And, you know, the tweet said something along the lines of, um, I hope he enjoys Europe because I just felt at the time that, like you said, he doesn't he doesn't have the explosiveness that you want to see out of someone in order to create their own shot. You know, the the, the term is athleticism. You know, we talk about how fast a guy can can run, how quick he is off you know off the dribble in that first step, and how high can he jump. And and Tyra Haas doesn't really seem to jump off of the stat books in any of those. In any of those regards, I mean, he's a fine ball handler, but he's not going to cross anybody over. He's not going to blow by anybody at the hoop. In fact, I don't even think he was the best driver to the hoop on his team, not even the third best probably. I mean, I, I feel like obviously uh, Kyle Collinsworth was better getting to the hoop. I feel like Chase Fisher was better. Anson Winder was better. Uh, I feel like there's just a lot of guys that were better at getting the hoop than him. Um, and unfortunately, you're right. The NBA is a one-on-one -on -one game. Uh, they care very little in the NBA about how well you can curl at 14 feet and and, and drain a 14 footer, uh, for whatever reason. Just that's not the way NBA offensive offenses run. You know, the last guy that I remember really running that was under Jerry Sloan offense was Matt Harper. You know, if you remember him coming off low baseline screens and curling up to the elbow and, and knocking down the jump shot, and Jerry Sloan offenses had those types of uh, plays all the time. But that's just, I mean, that's a you know, he, he retired, <laughs> you know, and, and it's just not the way the game is played anymore. Um, that being said, 
I can, I could see a very end of the second round NBA team saying, well, you know, gosh, you know, I don't know, the Spurs or, or somebody like that saying, you know, we see this guy who has just an amazing work ethic and who has shown that he's able to work this year, you know, this last off season, he worked on his three point shot. Not that it was ever bad, but he, he, he's a much better three point shooter now. So I wonder if maybe uh, a team that thinks, Hey, we'd love to have a guy who could come in and just kind of contribute um, blue collar style. But I don't know. I mean, I, I, I'll bounce it back to you with this last thought. Um, Jimmer, I wonder if maybe his failure as a number five overall pick has tainted white guards from BYU. You know what I mean? I mean, just the fact that he has, he is the face of BYU basketball still, and he's for better or worse and right or wrong labeled as a bust in the NBA. Yeah. First of all, he was a 10th overall pick. So let's, Oh, you're right. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. He was. <laughs> Uh, I I don't I don't think it's that I really don't think it, it's it's a Jimmer stigma you know that that's over BYU I I just think it just comes down to a, a, an ability and, and Tyler Hodge I just don't think has the ability to create his own shot against superior athletes and that's what you're going to have in the NBA I mean you saw teams that had scouted him um, over the course of his career um, and were able to adjust to him and with mediocre athletes. I mean, Gonzaga is the only team he in the conference um, mountain West and or West coast that he played against that he didn't score 20 points on. Um, and it's because Gonzaga was able to shut him down because Lock he's down. got a very, I mean, not, not so much limited, but he, he's very proficient at the things he does, but outside of his curls, kind of a wide open three um, and kind of a little floater. There's not much in there. Um, and again, I'm not dissing Tyler Haas because, I mean, obviously he's the all-time leading scorer at BYU. I, I love yeah. his game. He is fundamentally sound more so than many, many players coming yeah, he into has, he has a textbook um, BYU. Shot. Alone big. He does. He, he catches it in, in the window and, and it never leaves uh, out of a 90 degree angle. He's got an amazing looking shot. And that's why I think he's going to be Europe bound. And I think he will do well in Europe. I, I have a hard time seeing him not being successful in Europe. Um, I, again, I think he's got the size. I think, I just think his game is, is fit for Europe. Um, and now a lot of people are saying Europe is turning, is getting better. The world is getting better. There's no doubt about that. You can yeah. just look at international competition. It's getting better. Um, but, but that's where I think he's going to head. Um, I would be happy for him to have a stint, kind of like Brandon Davies, you know, had a couple, yeah. a year and a half stint with, with Philly, um, and he's no longer in the league. But Jimmer is on his way out, and I could see Jimmer going over to Europe, and I think Jimmer could be successful in Europe or China, you know, one of the international leagues. Yeah. I just, it, it just plain and simple comes down to Tyler Hawes. If you want to put him in a one on one ISO situation, he can't do it. He will not be able yeah. to do it. In the NBA, I mean, I hate I hate playing the race card, but I mean, in the NBA, relatively slow uh, white shooting guards are are small nits. You know, you have your cream of the crops, and obviously Kyle Korver, um, JJ Redick, and and those style. You know, Wally Serbiak was a little bit bigger, but still that kind of player, and they just. They just a small niche, and you have to be the best. I mean, Kyle Korver, you know, sets records for for shooting percentages from you know three point line. I, I if if, if Taylor if Tyler Haas could shoot you know fifty percent from three point line, then he I think he could get a niche in the NBA. But it's a small niche. It's not something that's super uh, at in demand. Mm -hmm. I think I think that's a good way to put it because it, it comes down to you know af at certain points it's do you pick the best player in the draft or do you pick right. to your need and right. usually it's around you know the first ten players um, you, you're picking the best player you don't really care who else is there you're picking the yeah. best player and then it becomes yeah. do you pick to the need um, and not many teams need a guy that can curl around from sixteen feet and mm -hmm. knock it down now I don't mm -hmm. think any team would hate if a guy could do that 
But sure. if the guy can do other things, be a lockdown defender, is a seven footer that can, you know, bang down down low or a six ten guy, you know, things like that. Um, that's not going to be their primary focus, and that that's what hurts Tyler Hawes. And uh, I I am a little more skeptical on his ball handling than you are. I thought you were a little kind on his ability to ball handle. I thought he always dribbled into pressure. He always went to dead man's corner and half court and three quarter court traps. Um, he he was never really aware of defenses around him. I think that's part of that is, is um, the fact that their offense was just a go, go, go offense. And so you're constantly yeah. looking to go instead of um, paying attention to what was going on with the defense. You're more worried about yourself than you were um, adjusting to what's in front of you. And, and that's a problem because very, excuse me. Well, the NBA, you don't see a lot of presses, but, I mean, when you have one guy that can just sit there and guard you at full court and as you're trying to take it up and you can't do it, I, I, I think that hurts him. Yeah. Um, and, and I, I well, just don't – I don't see where he would go. BYU was terrible with the press all year. I mean, even at coming out of, out of timeouts in the last minute of the game, it seemed like when everyone in the stadium – knew that BYU was going to be pressed. BYU had, had trouble getting across the line. But that's a different story. Before we move on to the next topic, though, I mean, on the same range, the other kind of conversation is Kyle Collinsworth. Um, a lot of guys uh, saying that his stock is at the – I think we've chatted about this before, but is his stock at the highest it can ever be right now as a 23-year-old return missionary with some knee issues – uh, you know, setting the records and stuff with triple doubles. Is his stock the highest that it's ever going to get right now? And Yes, it is. It is the highest it'll ever get because I have a hard time believing he will do next year what he did this year. Right. I don't think he's incapable of it. I think he showed he's plenty capable of it, and I wouldn't be shocked if he does. Um, you, you have very few guys um, in basketball or in sports in general that are a do-it-all type of player. Um, you know, LeBron James comes to mind as a guy that can yeah. do literally Magic anything Johnson. and everything yeah. you want him to do. Yeah, Magic John, that's a, another great example. Um, very few of those guys come around. Jason the, Kidd. The thing, yeah. the thing that Kyle Collinsworth cannot do is shoot. <laughs> and in the NBA, again, it's a one-on-one -on -one league, and if you can't break a guy down, you need to be able to shoot from anywhere. That's why J.J. Redick is still in the league, because the guy can shoot the rock. Um, and he's 6'6", yeah. six, six, whereas Jimmer is six foot one, wearing high heels. And uh, so Kyle Collinsworth, I mean, he's a big body. He's got effort. He obviously had an amazing recovery. I think it's the highest that we'll get, but I don't think it's high enough for him to leave, and that's why he's going to come back. Yeah, I, th I think he's coming back, and all the interviews sound like he's coming back. Um, you know, I mean, what, when it don't when weren't they supposed to have already elected anyways, or was that is that date coming uh, up? I think that's crash any day now. Yeah, very soon is the uh, it, it might already have passed. Um, but uh, yeah, those are all good points. Another uh, thing I want before we move on from BYU basketball, this wasn't we we hadn't planned on talking about this, but we did hear this week Dave Rose said that the big-time Utah in-state high school recruit, uh, Frank Jackson, who reportedly decommitted from BYU and because uh, he's got some offers now from little programs like Duke. <laughs> um, uh, Dave Rose was asked by Jay Drew at the media day the other day, um, you know, if he has ever had a player decommit from BYU before. And this was Dave, Dave Rose's response. It was, no, I have not, and I still haven't. And he smiled. So that's good news for BYU fans on the recruiting front. Jay Drew tweeted out that he thinks that that just means that Frank Jackson didn't have the courtesy to tell Dave Rose <laughs> that he had decommitted, but it's, it's a big get nonetheless. Uh, BYU basketball, uh, you know, has a bright future. And speaking of BYU's future, uh, it took kind of a, I don't know, an unexpected turn today with the announcement of both Frank Bartley the fourth and Isaac Nielsen will be transferring next year. Uh, you know, with an overcrowded roster, uh, I think it's kind of inevitable, but um, Salt Lake Tribune reports that actually – they kind of asked Nielsen to start looking for other schools uh, and Frank Bartley, but Frank Bartley came as a surprise. So um, don't know where they're going yet, but what do you think 
went into that, Aaron, when you think about Isaac Nielsen and Frank Bar- Bartley the fourth? Um, I think I think from Isaac Nielsen's um, perspective, I think he he saw the pipeline. I think you know I think both of them saw the pipeline. Um, I think they see the pipeline of talent, the timing, and and you and I were talking about this before the show, and it, it just is it, the writings on the wall that your minutes are you're going to have to earn those minutes. And I think um, Bartley in particular, I think was a guy that was kind of looking forward to coming in and, and playing a lot of minutes. He played a lot of minutes last year. Um, it kind of faded. He kind of went in and out. And this year, he you could tell he never really gained favor. Um, in my opinion, he had a horrible NCAA tournament game this year that, in my opinion, kind of lost the game for BYU. That's a whole other subject. But That's harsh. Okay. It is, but go watch the game, and you'll see I'm right. Yeah, he has yeah. some major turnovers. Um, so it's hard because you don't like seeing guys leave, but the fact is if, they, if they're not, if their heart's not in it, you know, Matt Carlino, um, who was it, Demarcus Harrison a couple years ago? Like, if your heart's not in it, and you you can kind of feel your your place on the team is not where you wanted it to be, not where it should be. Um, I say you make the right decision. Um, yeah, I, I think yeah, I you think know, let him go. BYU sports in general, as of late, seem to be somewhat of a revolving door, where you know guys who don't feel like they fit in are leaving, and guys who want the experience at BYU are coming in. Uh, in fact, a big reason that Isaac Nielsen who's going to ju- is just a freshman this year. The, a big reason he must have decided to move on or must have been asked to move on is when you look at the, the guys coming in, Kyle Davis transferred from Utah state sat out last year and is coming back this year. Uh, and Jamal eights, although he's having some ankle problems, transfer from UNLV Two big guys uh, coming in and are expected to immediately contribute on top and of that coming back. Well, Mika's got another year on his mission, but yeah, you're right. By the time Isaac Nielsen would be a junior, he'd be back. And yeah, when you think about that roster with uh, with 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 Mika and let's see here, Eights, yeah, it's just going to be a junior. So Eights will be a senior with Mika back, and uh, let's see here, and Kyle Davis is also is a junior. So uh, you know the writing is kind of on the wall with Kafusi, Eights, Davis, and. Uh, and then Mika next year, it's just too many. I can't think of the right metaphor. Too many chickens in the coop, whatever. Because it, it, that, that it's funny because last year there was nobody at the you know the forward slash center position, and now all of a sudden it's really getting getting crowded because you don't forget Peyton Dastrup coming back the same year that, that Eric Mika does. I mean, think about that when Eric Mika and Dayton Pat that that. Front court is going to be Eric Mika, Peyton Dastrup, uh, and Corbin Kafusi as a junior. Those three, that is a serious front court right there. I mean, who are you going to start? You're going to get Dastrup off the bench so Kafusi can start and Mika can play a power forward? You're going to bring Kafusi off the bench to play to back up Eric Mika? It's a great problem to have. But, anyways, Isaac Nielsen saw that writing on the wall on, on the post position. And then with with uh, Nick Emery uh, coming home early from his mission and announcing that he's going to be playing on the team next year, you know, Frank Bartley said, I'm not going to be getting any more minutes that I've got that I've been getting. And that ain't very many. So, yep. I, I agree with you. And then, then you got uh, Jordan Chapman that is, should be um, taking up some of the minutes from, right. win- from winder departing. Um, so I, I think, I think again, you've mentioned it's a great problem to have that BYU just has such a good talent pipeline right now, whether that be RMs coming back from the Mish or, um, or just guys coming in or guys coming back from injury. Um, you still have Kyle Collinsworth and Chase Fisher going to be anchoring uh, your guard spots. So, um, you don't know, it is, Dalton it is, Nixon. yeah, Dalton Nixon had, had uh, towards the Josh end of the Sharp. Year, played some Josh Sharp graduated, um, Oh, he did. Oh, you are yeah. right. He was one of the seniors. Uh, he yeah. was one of the few seniors. So, yeah. I, I think, I think BYU is just they haven't had this much talent, um, kind of coming through the pipeline before, and that's why you're seeing the number yeah. of of transfers. Not that it's a lot. I mean, let's be honest. Every school goes through this. It just hasn't happened to BYU a lot, and I think it's because BYU hasn't had the kind of talent in their pipelines like they've had going anywhere from football. We've talked about it from football with guys transferring to basketball. And now you got talent coming into the baseball side of things. I mean, BYU, for some reason, their, their sports program has ironic how a few years after independence, you're getting a lot of money. Yeah. That's more starting to do for everybody. That's right. More on baseball in a minute, but um, you know, another guy that we forgot about in that front court that is almost definitely coming back next year is Nate Austin. 
the 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 coaching staff sounds very confident that he will be awarded that re, uh, medical red shirt. So when you talk about next year's front court with Nate Austin and Kafusi, the likely starters, although Kyle Davis really could. It sounds like he's probably going to compete to start in front of one of those two. But between eights, Davis, Austin, and Kafusi, there's there's no more minutes for for Isaac Nielsen. So that, you know, good problems to have. Uh, and, and, you know, BYU fans say goodbye to Frank Bartley with, um, I don't know, bittersweet happiness. I enjoyed Frank Bartley a lot. I liked his energy. Uh, especially at the beginning of his freshman year, he seemed to have a lot of potential, and he was a very exciting player to watch. But as time went on, he just seemed less and less comfortable in, you know, in the system, and just seemed to be more turnover prone than play making. Yeah. He, he so, definitely, he definitely found his way out of the rotation, and, and he played his way out of it. I don't think it was so much other guys were stepping up as he just wasn't performing. He was turning the ball over. He wasn't finishing at the rim. Um, defensively, yeah. he was he was okay. So I, I think that's what it came down to. And um, you know what? I wish him best of luck. Like you said, I he did have a lot of problems. I know he became one of your guys' um, favorite guys to watch early in his freshman year. But uh, yeah, best of luck to wherever he goes. Yeah, well, I'm looking forward. To, I, I hope he does well. I really do. I, I, I hope he does well. Uh, not so that you would ever. FYI, Kyle Collinsworth has until April 26th to declare for the draft, so he's got a little less. Right, I knew it was coming up soon, so we'll you know, keep an eye on that. I think I'm really interested to see how that turns out. And, you know, like you said, we are we got our hometown boy, Jor, uh, Jordan Chapman, that's looking to probably compete for the, you know, the backup point guard role, depending on Nick Emery, whether he's going to play more of a shooting guard or, or a true true point guard. But I, I'd love to see Chapman get some some backup roles on this on this team as well. So that um, you know, who knows what can happen with Kyle Collins with you need a point guard that can run this team. Emery will uh, take so. the point guard backup point guard duties. And I think Chapman will be your your primary two right behind Fisher. Okay. I mean I, it depends on how it's gonna run, you know, who whose ball you want that you know, whose hands you want the ball in. So, you know, we'll really look close to that. The last topic tonight, though, big news out of BYU baseball. You don't hear that sentence very often, but All-American Kyle Dean decommitting from the University of San Diego, uh, somewhat of a college baseball powerhouse, and deciding to come to BYU. Now, here's the interesting thing about the 6'2", 6'2", um, outfielder from San Diego. He's not LDS. And it is very rare for any BYU sport to bring in a non-LDS All-American. I mean, he was on four or five All-American teams, including, um, let me look at this this report here, the Under Armour All-American and the Fer Perfect Game USA, um, first team All-American. Uh, the guy is, a, is actually projected to perhaps be um, drafted into the into Major League Baseball in the first round and perhaps even top 20. I mean, the dude is serious baseball player, and he's coming to BYU. You know, you mentioned it early in the show. We have some uh, baseball pedigree in our non-bloodlines. Our sister married a former BYU baseball player, Derek Spikner, and um, – I'm just really interested to see. If you haven't listened, everyone should go back and listen to the interview he had last week on BYU Sports Nation because he uh, he sounded really excited to come to BYU. He just he said he's really really looking forward to taking this the program to the next level. He said he loved the coaches. He said he loved the school. The fans have been really great to him. He just sounded really excited about coming to BYU. So maybe. BYU baseball, next big thing on the BYU athletics, you know, landscape. You know, the re the reason he came to BYU is because of the thin air, so he can hit a few more bombs. And That's just right, Colorado Rocky style, right? <laughs> yeah. No, it is. It is interesting. You know, I mean, I know BYU. Their their program has been it has been improving compared to you know five six years ago. Jacob Hanneman, uh, a couple years ago, who was also a do a scholarship athlete um, to play for uh, BYU football, ended up getting drafted to I believe it was the Cubs in the second or third round just a couple mm -hmm. years ago. 
Um, <clears throat> not sure where he is in their minor league system, but BYU's got some guys on their radar. I know they had about three guys drafted in um, in the last. You know, I know baseball draft is like sixty five rounds or whatever the heck it is. Um, but it, it's, it's exciting news because you're right. BYU in any sport doesn't really get a lot of high school all Americans, let alone a guy with multiple all Americans, and let alone a guy who's not LDS. So that's definitely rarefied air for BYU. Um, congrats to Coach Littlewood for. Um, yeah for grabbing that kind of recruit that says something about BYU um, and the program that he's building there. And, and a lot, I, you know, I'm reading through some of the, the interview notes from, from Kyle Dean and what he, everybody likes to mention Tom Homo. It's amazing. Yeah, what an everyone loves him. He's so supportive. Has. He's so, so I, I mean, I know I, I have the blue goggles of the blue goggles, um, but I don't see a lot of athletic directors that just seem to have the, um, not the athleticism, but the, the emotional support and charisma behind each one of his programs, whether that be women's volleyball, women's soccer, to BYU. Um, yeah, he was, football, he was at the so national. Involved. He was at the national dance competition, dance where the Cougarettes took their 14th straight national championship. He was there, and I believe you know they were talking about they think the they think he was the only AD there representing <laughs> their schools. I mean, the dude is just. He he just exudes BYU sports, and he supports supports them like a parent. And and you're right, he did mention that. Um, he mentioned the coaches that Mike Littlewood was the first guy as soon as he decommitted from San Diego. Um, Mike Littlewood was the first guy to contact him, and and really, sh he said that really showed him how much BYU wanted him. And um, interesting side note here, and I tweeted about this earlier. Um, I don't know how this connection came about, but apparently he be through the recruiting process, he became friends with Kyle Van Noy. And he said one of the first guys he called after being recruited by BYU and after he committed to BYU, one of the first guys he called was Kyle Van Noy. Now, I think this is a really, really big deal, and I'll tell you why. A couple months ago, a Kyle Van Noy was on the Monty Show, Monty in the Morning, I believe it was the Monty show. And he was talking about um, that one basketball game where there's a lot of football recruits there and they're all kind of like in halftime hanging out on the floor. Um, and he was asked, Kyle Van Noy was asked, oh, 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 you're helping out with the recruiting. And Kyle Van Noy sounded very um, annoyed, saying, no, I was not recruiting. They haven't really asked me to recruit. I've kind of moved on. You'd think they'd hit me up more to help with recruiting, but they don't. And he seemed, I mean, I was actually disheartened at the interview. Kyle Van Noy sounded uh, a little bit disgruntled with BYU. And it was through kind of this, the time when a lot of BYU former players were kind of coming out saying the Broncos, um, you know, relationship with alumni is a little bit broken. Anyhow, what came out of it is a lot of people thought B Kyle Van Noy was disgruntled with, with BYU. But the fact that he was so big on one of these baseball recruits, and and this was this was the words of uh, Kyle Dean. He said that when, when uh, he told Kyle Van Noy, Kyle Van Noy said that he got chills when he said that, he, with that Kyle Dean was, was announcing. So I think that's big news to show, to kind of dispel the myth that Kyle Van Noy is, you know, well, annoyed with BYU or sick of them has put them in the rearview mirror or something. It, it seems to be the off-season story of, about these disgruntled um, yeah. alumni. And, and Bronco has even come out, you know, Bronco in particular. He's addressed it. Mm -hmm. uh, has addressed it and said, we need to do better about that. And, and when you consider, I mean, BYU's football heritage, Kyle Van Noy, uh, John Beck, you know, kind of those – those, just those guys. Ziggy I mean, Steve, Steve Young, Young, Ziggy. I mean, they've got Chad Lewis, who's obviously. Uh -huh. Yeah, Chad Lewis and and all those other guys. You know, Bronco did address this uh, when a lot of those guys, Derek Stevenson, Derek Stevenson, and others started talking about the poor relationships with the fan. Uh, I'm sorry, with the alumni. Uh, what the first step was actually, if you remember national signing day, where they had a bunch of alumni come up and announce each recruit, which was a cool first step. And Bronco is the first to admit that he'd like to help with those relationships more. And I think it's a big deal. I think it's a really big deal. And I just brought up the Kyle Van Noy thing with Kyle Dean on baseball, just to show, look, it's not bad blood between Kyle Van Noy and BYU. It's just, you know, for whatever reason that day, Kyle Van Noy seemed not to, you know, hip on helping with BYU recruiting. But sounds like he's back on the boat. So 
Uh, well, Aaron, I think that's about all the time we have tonight. It looks like you're having technical difficulties anyways, but um, uh, you're back, Aaron. I was just about to close up the show. Um, any, any final thoughts about uh, BYU baseball, BYU football, alumni relationships? What was that, Andy? I was just saying I'm about to close up close up the show here, but uh, do you have any final thoughts? Um, no, I, I just I just think uh, BYU fans need to realize that during this time of year, there's just a lot of news going on, little things that affect the seasons moving forward. Um, I think I think BYU's got a lot of bright things going on in their future coming up um, for all the sports. Again, that baseball news is, is really interesting news stuff I haven't really heard in the past before. Um, this football season is going to be just epically amazing to watch. Um, and uh, I, that's about all I got. San Antonio, I'm, I'm ready for the summer down here. I'll tell you what. <laughs> tell you what you are turning into a Texan yeah. okay well thanks for thanks for joining us this week guys uh, remember at sports bros you can find us on Twitter our online home is torn by uh, make sure to download us and subscribe on iTunes and or stitcher listen to us every single not every single day but every single week we'll talk about BYU sports and things surrounding everything BYU athletics we'll see you guys next week go Cougs